Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Jack Henry and Associates Second Quarter Fiscal Year 2020 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker, Mr. Kevin Williams, Chief Financial Officer. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Sheree. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for the Jack Henry Associates Second Quarter Fiscal 2020 Earnings Call. I'm Kevin Williams, CFO and Treasurer, and on the call with me today is David Foss, our President and CEO. In just a minute, I'll turn the call over to Dave to provide some of his thoughts about the state of our business and performance of the quarter. Then I will follow that up with some additional thoughts and comments regarding the press release we put out yesterday uh, after market closed. And then I will also provide some updated guidance for FY20, and then we'll open the lines up for Q&A. First, I need to remind you that this call includes certain forward-looking statements, including remarks or responses to questions concerning future expectations, events, objectives, strategies, trends, or results. Like any statement about the future, these are subject to a number of factors that could cause actual results or events to differ materially from those which we anticipate due to a number of risks and uncertainties. The company undertakes no obligation to update or revise these statements. For a summary of these risk factors and additional information, please refer to yesterday's press release and the sections in our 10K entitled Risk Factors and Forward-Looking Statements. Also, on this call, we will discuss certain non-GAAP non -GAAP financial measures, including non-GAAP revenue and non-GAAP operating income. The reconciliations for historical non-GAAP financial measures can be found also in yesterday's press release. I'll now turn the call over to Dave. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. We're pleased to report another quarter with strong revenue and earnings growth. As always, I'd like to begin today by thanking our associates for all the hard work that went into producing those results for our second fiscal quarter. For Q2 of fiscal 2020, total revenue increased 9% for the quarter and increased 8% on a non-GAAP basis. The conversion fees were up about a million dollars over the prior year quarter, so although that variance contributed to our overall revenue performance, it wasn't the explanation for this very strong quarter. Turning to the segments, we again had a solid quarter in the core segment of our business. Revenue increased by 7% for the quarter and increased by 6% on a non-GAAP basis. Our payment segment also performed well, posting a 10% increase in revenue this quarter on both a GAAP and non-GAAP basis. We also had a strong quarter in our complementary solutions businesses with a 10% increase in revenue this quarter and an 8% increase on a non-GAAP basis. As I mentioned in the press release, our sales teams again had a very solid quarter, and total sales bookings are now running 18% ahead of last year's record pace. In the second fiscal quarter, we booked 17 competitive core takeaways and 20 deals to move existing in-house customers to our private cloud environment. We also saw very strong bookings in our payments and complementary solutions segments. We signed 30 new clients to our new debit card processing solution and three new clients on the credit card side of the business. All of those 33 card contracts and 17 competitive core takeaways represent new revenue to Jack Henry. Our banner digital platform also experienced very strong demand with 25 new clients signing for the full digital suite. As you may have noticed, we published a press release last Thursday regarding the availability of our new JHA Bank Anywhere solution. I'm happy to announce that we currently have four banks in live production on Bank Anywhere and have several more in the queue to be installed. This solution is a cloud-based core and digital banking solution offered to digital-only banks. It leverages the complete set of open APIs built by our BANO team to enable easy connectivity to the core and other complementary functions. If the digital bank is a new charter, we can provide the core and the API connectivity they need to integrate solutions from virtually any FinTech provider. If the digital bank is an offshoot of a traditional brick and mortar institution, we can deploy Bank Anywhere regardless of the core system the traditional bank is running. This solution is just another example of the many innovative technology solutions being offered today by Jack Henry to help our banking clients compete in the digital world. Regarding our new debit and credit processing solution, we now have well over 600 customers live on the new platform. This count includes 73 customers installed as new debit clients rather than as migrations, 
and 13 new full-service credit clients now live on the platform. We have approximately 300 of our debit clients yet to migrate, but as I mentioned on the last call, we suspended our migrations during the holidays because banks and credit unions don't like to implement changes to their card programs during that time of the year. We completed another round of migrations in January and remain on track to complete the migration process during calendar 2020. Although we haven't done a press release on this, I'm happy to announce that in December, we became the first processor in the country to bring a financial institution live with the real-time payments network through the clearinghouse, and we'll bring the second customer live later this month. As I mentioned on the last call, our pay center solution has been designed to allow us to connect clients to the real-time payments network in groups rather than one at a time. Additionally, we provide connectivity through this single platform to multiple providers, which facilitates a more logical and efficient approach for our clients than any other processor in the market today. As we begin the second half of our fiscal year, we continue to be optimistic about the strength of our technology solutions, our ability to deliver outstanding service to our customers, our ability to expand our customer relationships, the spending environment, and our long-term prospects for success. With that, I'll turn it over to Kevin for some detail on the numbers. Thanks, Dave. The service and support line of revenue increased 8% compared to the prior year quarter. Our license and related in-house support created some headwinds by both being down a combined $3.1 million for the quarter compared to last year, which primarily is due to the continued movement of customers to our private cloud, which actually is good for us and our shareholders long-term in many ways. Outsourcing and cloud services were up nicely again this quarter at an increase of 16% compared to last year, as Dave mentioned, deconversion fees were up a little over a million dollars compared to a year ago quarter. The processing line of revenue, which is all of our transaction, remittance, card, and digital, grew a very nice 10% compared to the prior year quarter. Total revenue was up 9% for the quarter compared to last year, and on a non-GAAP basis, our revenue was up 8% for a quarter by excluding the deconversion fees. Reported consolidated operating margins were down slightly from 22.8% last year to 22.4%, this year primarily due to lower license fees and the continued increase in additional costs related to our card processing platform migration. But we will continue to see these margin headwinds for the remainder of this fiscal year and into next fiscal year until we can eliminate the additional costs re related to the platform migration. With the cost reductions that we have talked about on previous calls that we will see the impact from in the first and third quarters of FR21, the impact those cost reductions will have on our quarterly and fiscal margins will remove those headwinds and allow us to return to a position of leveraging our operating income margins. Our segments operating margins continue to be very solid with small fluctuations, but our payment segment will continue to have that increased margin headwind going forward as the additional costs continue to increase as we migrate customers to the new payments platform until we can get the last core customers off in Q4 of this fiscal year. The effective tax rate for the quarter was relatively flat with last year at 23.2% this year compared to 22.9% last year. For cash flow included, included in the total amortization, which was disclosed in the press release, is the amortization of intangibles related to acquisitions, which decreased to $4.9 million year-to-date this fiscal year compared to $5.2 million last year. Our depreciation is up year-to-date, primarily due to data center capex in the first half of last year, and hardware upgrades this fiscal year, which are in production. And our non-acquisition amortization is up due to more of our internally developed products being placed into production. Operating cash flow was $215 million for year-to-date, which is up from $192 million last year. And during the first half of the year, we invested $94.2 million back into our company through CapEx and developing products, which is up a little over 5% from $89.7 million a year ago. For, to update your FY20 guidance, as we have discussed previously, we have no control over the timing of recognized deconversion fees that we receive. However, at this time, we anticipate deconversion revenue to be relatively flat for the remainder of the year compared to last year's second half, which means FY20 will be up over the previous year due to the large first quarter and the small increase we had in Q2. In addition, revenue from our processing and private cloud customers will continue to grow nicely, and therefore our total gap revenue should grow a little over 9% for full year FY20 compared to FY19. 
and then excluding deconversion fees from both years and the incremental revenue contributed this year from the acquisition of GZO, which will be about approximately $10 million for the full year, our non-GAAP revenue should grow a little over 8% compared to last year. With increased deconversion fees offset by the continued decreased license and related implementation revenue and the additional cost headwinds from our payments platform migration, we project operating income will grow at a slight discount to revenue growth at a little above 8% on a GAAP basis. Then excluding the revenue and related costs associated with deconversion fees and the small net operating income impact from the acquisition, our operating income should grow between 6 and 6.5% on a non-GAAP basis for the full fiscal year. We will continue to experience revenue and operating income fluctuations between our fiscal quarters due to license, implementation, payment platform migrations, and software subscription usage. We anticipate GAAP operating margins for the year to be mostly in line with FY19 at approximately 22% for the year, and excluding all the things just mentioned, we expect non-GAAP operating margins of approximately 21%. Our effective tax rate for the full fiscal year will continue to be between 23 and 23.5%. We project Q3 EPS to be in the range of 80 to 82 cents. And for the full year of FY20, we are increasing our EPS guidance from the previous range of $3.60 to $3.64 we provided last quarter to a current projected range of $3.70 to $3.72. This concludes our opening comments, and we are now ready to take questions, Sheree. Will you please open the call lines up for questions? Of course. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Vasu Goville with KBW. Hi. Thanks for taking my question, and congrats on a great quarter. Um, I guess the first question, you've clearly seen pretty strong top-line performance, and we're seeing the guidance raised here. Can you talk about, like, outside of the conversion fees, where you are seeing more strength versus what you'd anticipated coming into the year, and also the sustainability of this 8% non-GAAP revenue growth beyond 2020? So I'll comment first, and then I'll ask Kevin to uh, add on anything that he wants to add. So first off, I think the uh, the win rate that we're seeing on the core side of the business and virtually every core customer that we're signing now is a hosted core customer, which means you, know, you don't just get revenue pop on the front end. You get revenue that layers in and is sustainable. Normally, those customers are signing a seven-year contract these days, sometimes 10-year contract. Uh, the payments business, so we've talked many times on this call about the reason that we went through the, the uh, conversion to the new payment to the card platform. The reason was we were not only not winning customers five years ago, but we were starting to lose customers because the functionality wasn't there. Uh, today, we're signing new customers, bringing new revenue in uh, because of the functionality uh, on the payments platform that we didn't have before. And we certainly are seeing a, a good demand as, as referenced on the call. I, I pointed out we signed 30 new debit and three new credit customers just in this single quarter. Um, so that certainly is adding and is sustainable for us. Uh, the interest that we have on the digital side of the house, so I referenced 25 new clients for our full suite uh, digital uh, banking platform, um, that is uh, continuing to grow, and uh, we're continuing to see strong demand in that area. So, And I could list a number of other products, but uh, those are kind of the headlines as far as where a lot of the product growth is coming from, and uh, and that growth is still out there. The pipeline is solid. I mentioned the sales team is running uh, well ahead now this year, not just ahead of what their quota was, but ahead of last year's record pay record pace. That's the important point here, is that they're running ahead of last year's record sales year. Um, so a lot happening as far as new product sales. And then, Kevin, whatever you want to add to that. So the only thing I'd add to that is if you remember last fiscal year, we signed 57 new core customers we signed 22 new core customers this year to date, so we're keeping pretty much on a pace of, of one a week, uh, actually for the last couple of years. Uh, as, as we continue to convert and migrate those customers over to our platforms, that's going to continue to drive both core and company revenue. And as Dave mentioned in his opening comments, we continue to see a very solid uh, move of our existing in-house customers from in-house outsourcing, which is just very nice built-in organic revenue uh, as we move those customers over and, and we get a, a larger wallet share out of those institutions. 
Great, thanks. That's very helpful. And just a quick follow-up on the sort of M&A environment that we're seeing in the banking industry. There's been a couple of merger of equals where I guess you guys are the core provider um, for one of the parties, and these are potentially larger than average client relationships for you. And I just wanted to get a sense for how you're thinking about your competitive positioning, about winning these conversions, or um, if you think say, your competitors may have a better hand given that they're more dominant players up market. Um, sure. Well, you know, it's no secret that some of our uh, competitors have a more dominant position in the uh, in the uh, upper tiers of the market. But we're well positioned. We've talked many times on these calls about all the solutions that we've been rolling out uh, to serve larger uh, financial institutions. The thing that I would encourage you to keep in mind, uh, though, and, and I I feel great about our position with some of these uh, deals that are happening right now, but. You know, the thing to keep in mind is these days uh, the core represents a certainly a, a, a nice piece of the business, but because so much, so many of our solutions are offered through the profit stars channel today, meaning they are uh, provided regardless of what the core solution is, it's possible for us these days to lose on the core side and still uh, have it be a win for Jack Henry because those larger institutions oftentimes, oftentimes are in-house rather than hosted. And so they're not paying nearly at the, the rate of a hosted customer, you know, in our private cloud. And if they uh, retain some of the complementary solutions, which are hosted in private cloud at Jack Henry, you know, that can end up being a, a real win for Jack Henry. So we are we are in several of those deals, and we are well positioned to win those deals. But as you point out, you know, we're not the dominant player in that space. And so if we were to lose on the core side, there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity for Jack Henry in the non-core piece of the business with those customers. And just a reminder, those 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 customers uh, are typically in-house customers. So, uh, if we were to have to lose them, we're losing in-house maintenance, and none of those customers that you're talking about represent more than one percent of our revenue. Yeah. Got it. Thanks for the color. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kartik Mehta with North Coast Research. Hey, good morning, uh, Dave and Kevin. Dave, I wanted to just ask a little bit about uh, migration you're uh, doing on your debit and credit customers. And I think last time you talked about the retention was really good. You're not seeing any leakage of clients. I just wanted to find out, you know, where that stood and where, where you stand in terms of net clients uh, uh, as you roll out this new platform. Yeah, I think uh, so. It's a good question, Cardic. The, the le- so I, I didn't want to give the impression on the last call, and I certainly wouldn't on this call that we haven't lost any customers. But the good news is, I think every one of them, I maybe shouldn't say every, but the vast majority that have gone away, and there aren't that many, have been because they were acquired along the way. So we have had 30 or so customers, 40 somewhere in that range, that have been acquired or merged along the way. And so uh, you know, when they get acquired. Uh, sometimes their business is combined with somebody else. If it's a Jack Henry customer, they potentially go to a different platform. So we've lost a few along the way because of mergers, but I don't know of more than a, a handful that we've lost because they've decided that, you know, oh, we're, you're going to put us through a conversion. We ought to maybe look at other solutions. Let's look at going someplace else. Uh, that's been a very small number. But there have been some that, as I mentioned, have uh, have been lost because of, uh, because of M&A. But I would offset that with all of these new customers that we've signed. I've, I've headlined in here 73 are live already, and we have a number in the queue, 73 that were not paying Jack Henry of anything, anything before on the debit uh, processing side before uh, for this new platform. Hey, and Kevin, um, I, I know uh, the savings from this uh, platform uh, you, you've uh, articulated in the past a little bit, and I'm wondering as you get more into it, have, have your thoughts changed at all as to – uh, the dollar amounts you can save uh, from this conversion? No, I mean, the, the dollar amounts I gave previously, Cardi, I, I think are still pretty solid. I think there's still some potential upside uh, to those numbers. Uh, you know, we always try to be somewhat uh, conservative and cautious when we give uh, numbers like that. But, but the numbers I gave for savings that we're going to see as we shut the two platforms down in, in Q4 this year and Q2 next year, uh, obviously, as, as Dave mentioned, we're, we're still on course to get all of our core customers off uh, in Q4 and then the remaining non-core customers off the second platform off by uh, by the end of Q2. So we'll see those those nice costs. And, and obviously, if you kind of take those, uh, those cost savings that we're going to see that I've provided in the past and just throw those into this year's quarter, uh, obviously, the, the margins look a whole lot better. 
And then finally, just Kevin, just I just want to make sure on the deconversion fees. As of now, from what you can see, you would expect second half of this fiscal year to be the same as second half of uh, last fiscal year. That's what it looks like right now, Carter. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from John Davis with Raymond James. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, Dave, maybe you want to start out on the bookings number. Yeah, I think 18% is pretty robust, but also trying to remember the last time you gave that on kind of a quarterly basis. So how does that compare with either last quarter or last year, and then how long does it take for those bookings to turn into revenue typically? Uh, I, I don't, I can't give you an accurate, uh, number as far as last quarter, but it's, you know, my key point there was we're up 18% year to date over last year at this time. Um, so it's, again, it's not a comparison to quota. It's a comparison to actual performance last year by the sales team, booking up 18%. I, I, I can't give you a, an accurate number as compared to last quarter. Uh, last quarter was strong, uh, but um, the second quarter combined with the first quarter uh, produced this really outstanding uh, run rate for the half of the year. As far as when things translate to revenue, because today most of the solutions that we sign are uh, we're delivering as a hosted uh, solution, regardless of whether it's core or any of the other things we deliver, it's, it's rare for us anymore to sell a licensed copy of software. And so in every one of those instances then where it's a, a hosted in the cloud uh, delivery, uh, that revenue is layered in over time. So, you know, a core conversion, usually you start to see uh, processing revenue a year or so after we sign the deal. Uh, payments can, uh, 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 contract, you can start to see revenue oftentimes within a quarter or two. Uh, you know, so it just depends on what the solution is, wh uh, what the timing is. And sometimes that's driven by us. You know, we need X amount of time in order to complete the conversion. Sometimes it's driven by the financial institution because they need to do training and you know, make sure everybody's ready for whatever it is that we're delivering. So um, it's it's all over the board as far as when things get uh, get layered in, uh, when the revenue starts to produce. But I think the key point in that is today it's rare for us to see it in the the same quarter or the next quarter because it's so rare for us to sell a licensed version of the of the uh, solution. Okay, that's helpful. And then maybe just quickly dive in a little bit on payments growth. I think third trade quarter of acceleration. You know, it was north of 10% this quarter, and he called out some of the, the new wins there. But, you know, how should we think about that kind of going forward? Um, you know, keep waiting for it to, to come back down a little bit as cons get tougher, but it keeps kind of growing faster. So, you know, how should we think about that going forward? Is this a business that can grow double digits in the near term, or, you know, kind of any changes to the longer-term outlook of that business? So, John, just kidding. <clears throat> I mean, and we've talked about this many times before. I mean, if, if you think back – Three, three to four years ago when we started this migration, we were, we were losing, uh, quite a few customers off our debit platform because we did not have the technology they wanted. When we made this, this move, you know, a little over two years ago and came out and, and told the world that we were going to make this move, we kind of stopped the bleeding, uh, but we were still losing customers because we had customers that had already signed to leave at the time. Uh, so about a year ago, we finally finally totally stopped the bleeding. We started signing a few new customers. Uh, but as Dave mentioned, we signed quite a few new customers last year. We continue to sign them this year, uh, and we're not losing those customers now. So uh, the growth that we're seeing right now, I, I and I, I predicted this a year ago, and I was very hesitant to do it, but I, I think this accelerated payments growth is, is going to – we're going to see that. Uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, because of, of the new wins that we're having. And, uh, obviously the, the new wins that Dave mentioned that we signed this quarter, none of those are even producing any revenue yet. Gotcha. And then quickly, just on the, the revenue guide for the full year, I think there's about a 70 basis point, uh, tailwind from the, um, Vizio deal. Um, but even if I back that out, you know, it looks like you guys are kind of calling for deceleration in the back half of the year despite, you know, I think, what would be easier comps. I know last year we had a lot of accounting-related noise that messed up this, the kind of the quarterly cadence. But any reason from an accounting perspective or otherwise? Well, John, we still, have the, we still have the same accounting noise because, remember, under 606, uh, Q1 is, is going to continue to be a very strong quarter because of all the, all the software as a service that we sell and subscription software that we recognize 100% of that revenue in Q1. Uh, so, I mean, Q2 was, was actually a little stronger than I thought it was going to be, 
Q3 and Q4 will be a little little slower growth than the first half just because Q1 will continue to be our strongest quarter under the new 606 rules. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Joseph Foresi with Cantor Fitzgerald. Uh, hi. Uh, my first question is just around the competitive environment. Obviously, uh, your competitors are going through sort of some massive uh, M&A at this point. Um, how, how, what is, what are you seeing, uh, from a day to day, uh, win perspective? How distracted do you think those players are? And is this creating an environment where you're allowed to take, uh, you know, some more market share? Uh, it's a good question, Joe. I've been hesitant on these calls in the past to say that our uh, major competitors are so distracted that that's going to create a, a whole bunch of opportunity for Jack Henry. I've had a number of people in the industry suggest that that's uh, happening and is probably going to happen. Uh, our, our win rate uh, is running right now on the core side at you know a little over one new core deal per week, and but we've been at that pace for about two and a half years now. Um, we see a lot of uh, interest in Jack Henry uh, solutions. As I mentioned before, sales are up overall. Um, and can I attribute that to our competitors taking their eye off the ball? I don't know that I'm prepared to do that yet, but um, we are certainly um, we are certainly engaged in a lot of deals right now, and uh, the pace of activity with Jack Henry is, I don't know if I can say at an all-time high, but I've, it's probably about an all-time high right now as far as interest in Jack Henry solutions and the pace of, uh, of, uh, of interest that we see out there in the market. And, you know, I'm not ready to to ascribe that to, uh, you know, anything specific happening with our competitors. I just know there's a lot of interest in Jack Henry technology solutions. Got it. And then you talked a little bit about, and we've seen some solid results from some of the upgrade of your offerings. Uh, that's my, you know, my uh, read on it. Um, and I'm wondering, do you feel like you've got the full suite in place now and that uh, maybe that upgrade, I'm just trying to get at what is causing, you know, sort of the pickup over the last 12, 24 months uh, in deal wins. Uh, do you feel yeah, like maybe yeah. you've, it's the improvement in your suite of offerings and that, uh, you know, some of the card upgrades or product upgrades on the card side are uh, leading to it? Um, I'm just trying to get a sense again of what, what's caused the uptick. Yeah, I do. I, I think it's a, it's a solid observation. So we've spent a lot of time, particularly in the last year and a half or two years, talking about all these new technology solutions we've rolled out, treasury management and the Bano suite, the digital suite, and our enterprise risk management solution. And now, you know, I just today talked about Bank Anywhere. We've been, we've been in the market almost a year, but we hadn't talked about it on this call yet because we wanted to make sure that everything uh, proved out. And so, uh, yeah, I think, you're, I think you're right. It's a combination of new look and feel, new user experience for some of the solutions that we've had for a while. But then we've rolled out a number of new technologies from the ground up, uh, new technology to our uh, customers and prospects that we just didn't have two or three years ago. And uh, so I, would, I think you're on the right track there with the idea that it's a, it's a kind of a refreshed and, and a much broader suite than we had previously. And then you add to that some of the acquisitions that we've done recently. So, you know, we haven't done – the acquisitions you've seen us do in the last two, three years haven't been needle movers as far as revenue is concerned, but they have definitely been needle movers from a strategic point of view. So we've created this very robust commercial lending center suite now that is getting a lot of attention. I didn't even talk about it on today's call, but I've talked about it many times in the past. Now, that was a very intentional move of a few little acquisitions that we put together to create that new solution. The Gizio acquisition, Kevin highlighted the revenue contribution on the call earlier. That's not a needle mover for Jack Henry, but from a strategy point of view, it definitely makes us a, a differentiated solution with our digital suite. So I think the combination of all of those things has positioned us, uh, positioned us well. Now, the challenge when you're in our business is you're never done. You know, you constantly have to be reexamining your solutions and refreshing and trying to find that opportunity to differentiate uh, from everybody else. But uh, I feel great about how we're positioned today with the things that we've been talking about on these calls for the last couple of years. And one other thing I throw, one thing I throw in there, Joe, is, you know, again, I, I think we have very clear focus. We, we go to the market primarily with two flagship products, Silver Lake on the bank side and Epsis on the credit side. Uh, and those are the products that we spend our R&D dollars on. And, you know, Silver Lake was picked last year by ITE as, as the best core system uh, for, for banks in the $1 to $50 billion space. So when you get that reputation and you have the core products to wrap all that new technology that Dave 
mentioned around those things. Uh, the combination of all that, I think, is why we continue to win and will continue to win in the market. Got it. And the last one for me, and Kevin, I'm glad you said something. Um, it's for you. Uh, we've been waiting for the margins to expand and free cash flow to pick up due to the sunset of the products. I know you said that, um, you know, it, it's a next year event. Um, can you just give us an update on your level of confidence that we're finally going to see that next year and maybe a little bit of detail around why, um, you know, you have that level of confidence? Thanks. Well, I mean, Joe, obviously we, we know what our cost is in the platforms that, that we're running on those, uh, on the, for our debit card systems today. We know, uh, the personnel, uh, that, that will be, uh, going away. So we know what those hard dollar costs are. And there's additional costs throughout the organization that we'll also be able to eliminate. So for, for the numbers that I gave and the numbers that are going to go away, uh, kind of in, in two big tranches in uh, Q4 this year and Q2 next year, I am extremely confident that those those costs will go away and we'll see very nice increases in margins in, in both Q1 and Q3 of next fiscal year. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Peter Heckman with Davidson. Good morning, gentlemen. Thanks for taking the question. Um, can you talk about any regulatory deadlines, including Cecil, that, that, that uh, may be playing into some of the bookings um, and anything else that, that's on the uh, on the radar that, that, that may act as a catalyst for some upgrades? Yeah, the good question, Pete. Uh, two years ago or a year and a half ago or whenever it was, uh, Cecil was definitely a catalyst for us, and I was excited to talk about Cecil back then. Um, today, although, um, you know, we had uh, uh, the first wave, I guess, January 1st uh, went into effect. But the second wave, the timeline has been extended, and so Cecil is definitely not a driver right now. Everybody who needed it by January 1 has it, and for those that needed it in the second wave, the, the smaller institutions, they've been given uh, an extra reprieve, so there's not much... Uh, not much action right now when it comes to CECL. And beyond that, no major regulatory uh, change that's driving uh, revenue uh, for us or any of our competitors. You know, there's just not a lot happening there that is uh, producing revenue. Obviously, we have a lot of expense around regulation. We're constantly having to ensure that our systems comply. Uh, but no revenue drivers right now be, uh, being uh, uh, fueled by a regulatory change. Got it. Got it. And then uh, just Another question on the commercial uh, on the commercial lending. Where does that product sit in the competitive landscape? What are some of the differentiating aspects? Is it more on the origination or, or, or management reporting side? That's the unique uh, piece of that solution is that it does all of those. So it's designed to be a uh, an online commercial lending uh, solution, meaning the borrower can apply for a, a commercial loan online. Uh, all electronic, so they don't have to drop off paper forms at the financial institution. They can do everything electronic. Um, it has a quick decision engine that came through one of the small acquisitions that we did. So if the bank chooses, they can automate the decision process. So the borrower, you know, for a smaller commercial loan, the borrower can get an automated decision back in an hour or, you know, 30 minutes or whatever uh, the bank sets. Uh, for larger uh, loans, they would normally send it to a loan committee or at least some uh, more formal review, but still can provide the response uh, online to the commercial borrower. And then for the bank, so it's not just the front-end origination of the loan to the borrower, it's for the bank to manage the loan through the life of the loan. So as um, requirements come up, for example, on an annual basis for the banker to uh, receive financial uh, statements and, uh, and uh, review and approve those financial statements, that's all automated into the same platform. So the back-end functionality at the bank is, uh, is there as well. So it's completely differentiated as compared to any other solution out there that's doing a commercial online commercial lending uh, offering. Um, so very, you know, people who kind of dig into it, commercial lenders who dig into it, are, are pretty impressed and love the solution. And the chief loan officer for the financial institution likes it because it's a it's a tool that allows the bar or the lender to be more efficient and, and spend more time with their clients and less time, you know, administering uh, or dealing with administrivia. Um, so, uh, being widely hailed by lenders as a productivity tool as well. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Glenn Green with Oppenheimer. Uh, thanks. Hey, good morning, Dave and Kevin. Good morning. I guess, 
guess the um, first question, the, you sort of alluded to the number of competitive takeaways. I think it was 17 in the quarter. Can you just sort of, first of all, what, what was it year to date, and can you sort of frame that relative to a typical year? It strikes me as a, an acceleration, like, you know, improved competitive position for you. Well, for the quarter it was, Glenn, but, you know, if you look at the first half of the year, so that's 23 or 24 for the first half of the year, um, which is why I said earlier, our pace for the last two and a half years has been one a week, uh, and we're on, we're continuing on that pace. So, you know, the, the, sometimes the thing about core decisions is they can lapse over into the next quarter. So we didn't have as many as normal in the first quarter, but a lot of those were really close to signing. You know, they fell into the second quarter, so it, you know, kind of, kind of evens out. So, I'm, I'm very comfortable saying we're on the same pace, which is leading the industry by far, uh, the same pace that we've been on for the last two and a half years or so, which is about one new core customer per week. Okay. And then, Dave, to, to an earlier question, you alluded to sort of, I think, the pace of demand at an all-time high. And I guess the question is why. Um, you can sort of allude to a number of factors, market environment. You alluded to better product suite. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you want to go there, but maybe a better competitive situation given your competitors may be distracted. Is there any way to sort of frame it why you're seeing sort of an all-time pace of demand? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I wish I could give you an absolute answer, Glenn. I think it's a combination of several of those things. I, as I highlighted earlier on the call, I think these new solutions that we've rolled out here in the past two, three years – are getting a lot of attention, a lot of demand. The payments platform, the treasury management solution, the Bano Digital Suite, Commercial Lending Center Suite, uh, Enterprise Risk, all these things that we've been talking about that we've rolled out in the last couple of years are creating demand not only for the solutions, but they're creating kind of a maybe a refreshed um, view of Jack Cash in the space as a a leader when it comes to new technology and doing innovative things with technology. I think it's a combination of uh, a variety of things. Uh, and, you know, when you, when you are winning at the pace that we have been on the core side, you know, people hear about that. And so then there's there's some of that, uh, you know, chatter that happens. How come these guys are winning these core deals? They must be doing something right. And I think it's a combination of all those things coming together. And uh, right now we don't see that slowing down. Okay, and then, Kevin, I think you said outsourcing grew 16% in a quarter. Um, yeah. My guess is it's new deals sort of converting on, but is sort of mid-teens sustainable? Uh, well, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if mid-teens is sustainable, Glenn, but, I mean, if you look back the last two years, our outsourcing has been growing at the 12 to 13% range. So, I mean, it popped up a little bit, but, but I think, you know, in, in that 12 to 14% is very sustainable. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Our next question comes from Dave Coning with Baird. Uh, <clears throat> hey, guys. Great job. And I just got a few numbers questions. I guess just to make sure, I think you've said before there's about 16 million cost savings once you you kind of uh, move off the, the old platform. Um, and I think you said a third in fiscal Q1 of 21 so if we think that $16 million is kind of $4 million per quarter, a third of that $4 million comes off in fiscal Q1, and then the full run rate is off by Q3, is that still the right way to think of it? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. And then the second one is just free cash flow. The pattern changed this quarter. Like you had an outstanding cash flow. Usually fiscal Q1 and 4 are really strong, and Q2 and Q3 are weak, just normal seasonal patterns. But Q2 – was like really strong this quarter. Is that a new pattern, or did something change like just for, just for this time? Well, a couple things, Dave. I mean, we we have if you look back over historical numbers, you're absolutely right. We've always been extremely strong in Q1 and Q4 because of our annual maintenance billings. Uh, but as as our business continues to shift to more not only recurring but more of a monthly billing and and uh, Cash inflow from our from our private cloud and our outsourcing and also from our payments, then our Q2 and Q3 are no longer cash burning quarters. They're both going to start. They're both starting to generate nice cash. So it's starting to level out a little bit, you know. And, and to that point, if you look back at our trailing 12 months, uh, we're just a little over 99 percent conversion of net income to to free cash flow. So we're getting right back up to. To that 100%, I think, you know, again, when we get into uh, FY21, I think our conversion rate is going to be well back up above 100% conversion uh, as we are able to take those additional costs out. 
Okay, great. And just one last quick one. You know, last year the organic growth pattern starting in Q1 went 8754. This year now it seems more like I think Q1 was 9, Q2 was 8, and it kind of feels like the rest of the year is going to be right around 8. So it's a much more stable year. I know Q1's a little higher still, but is is that more is this year more the norm now Q1 a little higher and then the rest of the year about the same compared to last year where it kind of decelerated through the year? You're exactly on point. So the rest of the year is going to be right at 8%, and we're going to finish the year gap, like I said, you know, over 9% and non-gap a little over 8% for the year. That's really good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brett Huff with Steven. Good morning, Kevin and Dave. Morning, Brett. Um, three questions for me. Number one, Dave, you mentioned the uh, Treasury and Cash Management Solution. That's kind of a favorite of mine to understand because it's such a new product and such a fragmented market. Uh, any uh, data on the wins there or, you know, uptick or downtick or kind of how's the interest in, in progress on that one? Sure, yeah. We signed seven uh, Treasury in the quarter. We have 36 live now. And... Um, Oh, I didn't bring the statistics with me. I just got the numbers for number of businesses and number of uh, users uh, live on the platform. It's uh, it's impressive, the number of uh, businesses and uh, end users at those businesses using the platform. But 36, um, uh, 36 institutions live today. That's helpful. And then <clears throat> to the point of moving up market, you kind of framed this up before and talked about the card business and how that product was needed to kind of service some of the larger banks. I think same thing with the cash management. I think it's sort of similar with the commercial lending. I know there's a couple others I'm probably missing. But as we sort of arm ourselves to compete more effectively as we move up market, how is the conversation going with those bigger banks, be they banks for whom you do profit stars things and are trying to sell them a core off a competitor, or maybe you're just going in cold to a bank where there, you don't have much relationship at all. And this is also framed in the context of these couple big deals that are mergers or M&A that, you know, how are, those, how are all those conversations going and what is the, what are you hearing from those banks? Where are you scoring points and where, you know, is the negotiation still sort of ongoing? Uh, I'm not going to talk specifically about any uh, negotiations, but just in general, I think the uh, you know the banks of that size. It, it's it's been interesting a lot of those conversations because there is a, there's a great deal of dissatisfaction. In fact, more than I realized, um, I've been in this business 34 years. A uh, great deal of dissatisfaction in, among the banks of those size around the topics of integration and. Uh, the ease of connecting to third parties, whether it be through a traditional tool or an API set. Um, there's a lot of uh, frustration, a lot of demand among those customers, so that bodes well for Jack Henry. You know, we have a great track record of open connectivity, developing tools that really make life easier for uh, the institution. Put that together with all of these new solutions that we've been rolling out that are specifically di designed for larger institutions, um, we're, we're scoring a lot of points there. Now, you know, it's no secret, and I, I referenced it earlier on the call, you know, if you don't have a track record in that space, say above $50 billion in, in assets, you know, that's, a, that's a, a difficult decision for somebody to say, okay, I think I'll be the first one to partner with these guys to go into that space on the core side. So uh, there are ongoing conversations. We're scoring points, but then, you know, there are things that work against us, and we're just going to continue hammering away at it. But for Jack Henry, it is a... Uh, we're committed to uh, moving up market, and you've seen us make a lot of moves here in the past uh, few years, and we're going to continue moving in that direction. But, you know, we don't have to be – we don't have to be the dominant player among the $100 billion banks to be successful. We have lots of uh, runway here doing what we are doing and have been doing, kind of slowly but surely growing up into that space. That's helpful. And then last one for me, just this whole MyTech, Wells Fargo, USAA thing that's going on, um, it's hard for us to kind of figure out when you pull that string who might get ensnared in that. How does that – does that relate to you all um, in any way, or do, how do we think about that? Anything to worry about there? I, I don't know that there's anything to worry about. It, it uh, potentially affects all of us that are in this space that offer, you know, uh, imaging solutions, whether it be image viewing through a, an Internet or digital banking solution, whether it be capturing checks and converting them to images, you know, those, uh, all of those technologies, which all of us that are major players in the space offer those technologies, um, you know, those are potentially, uh, uh, potentially come into play for, for all of us. But at this stage of the game, you know, I wouldn't categorize it as something to worry about, but it certainly is something that we have our, uh, have our eyes on.
Great. Thanks for the time, guys. Appreciate it. Bet. Thank you. Our next question comes from David Togut with Evercore ISI. Thank you. Good morning. Um, as you sit down with uh, bank and credit union CEOs, can you comment on their uh, 2020, uh, you know, IT budget growth outlook, uh, you know, top spending priorities, and then, you know, any nuance uh, you might offer, um, you know, let's say between larger banks and smaller banks would be uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Sure, Dave. I'll, I'll get survey information here uh, in the next, uh, within the next month or so, I think, uh, you know, there are a couple of surveys that we depend on every year. So everything I'll share with you is anecdotal. But the thing that I can say is in the fall of each year, I think you know, we host a, I host a CEO conference on the banking side and a separate one on the credit union side. And so those conversations, we usually have, you know, two, three hundred CEOs at those uh, meetings. Those conversations uh, often uh, we end up talking about the, the future for spending and their demand for technology and so on. And I can tell you, as of this late fall, just before uh, the holiday season, CEO optimism and their commitment to continue to spend was uh, was still there. I mean, there, in particular, things like uh, digital. So that's why I think a lot of demand we've talked about here around digital, any of them are trying to figure out how to modernize the consumer experience for their consumers and what are the tools they can use to modernize that. So that brings into play the online commercial lending center suite we talked about. It brings into play the Bano suite that we talked about. Um, so CEO optimism continues to be high. They've kind of adjusted to the interest rate environment that they live in. They're not happy about it, but they've adjusted to it. And uh, and we don't see that slowing down. And that's anecdotal. I'll get um, more formal survey information here, certainly before the next earnings call. But I don't expect a major shift uh, just based on what I'm hearing from the CEOs that we talked to. Appreciate that. And then just any nuance um, or kind of anecdotal information from your conversations between, you know, let's say mid to large size banks and, and smaller banks. You've had good traction with treasury management and, you know, in the up market space. So when you speak to some of the larger banks, are there any difference in terms of spending priorities, um, you know, demand picture for 2020? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think the, um, the maybe the only nuance there would be the larger banks are intensely focused on their efficiency ratio and are looking for what are those tools that can help drive their efficiency ratio up. Um, the smaller banks, the efficiency ratio is a topic, but they're not as intensely focused, not as ready to go spend money just to improve efficiency ratio. With larger banks, that is absolutely a key topic for them. That's probably the major difference that I see in the conversations. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press the star, then one key on your touchtone telephone. Our next question comes from Charles Nabhan with Wells Fargo. Hi, good morning, and thank you for taking my question. I was hoping you could comment on the long-term mo margin profile of the overall business. Given some of the momentum you've generated in um, some newer solutions that may not have been uh, as material contributors in the past, um, I was wondering if we look past 21 um, and the elimination of some of the um, redundant card pl platform fees, um, as the revenue mix changes, do, we, do you envision any material changes to the overall margin profile or any seasonal patterns? Well, so this, Karen, I, I, I don't think you're going to see much, much seasonal change because, uh, I mean, we're 86% recurring revenue now, and that's only going to get bigger. Uh, you know, payments – uh, continue to make up uh, about 36% of our revenue. Uh, our outsourcing and private cloud offerings are about 25 or 26% of our revenue, uh, and, and the balance of our recurring revenue is in-house maintenance, which that's slowly shifting over uh, to outsourcing, which those margins uh, continue to improve a little bit as our payments business continues to get larger. So as I said in my opening comments, once we get through – uh, the first half of 21 and get the costs, uh, the, those additional costs taken out, we're going to go back to our more traditional margins. And at that point, we'll go back to uh, getting some, some traditional margin expansion of, of, you know, 50 to 100 bits uh, a year for the foreseeable future. Great. Appreciate the callers. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. I am showing no further questions in the queue at this time. I would now like to turn the call back over to management for any further remarks. Thanks, Sheree. Uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that once again, we'll be holding our annual analyst day. 
uh, in the Dallas, Texas area on Monday, May 11th. And to Brett Huff's point, some, we will have the mini tech fair again. So uh, some of the products that we'll be highlighting there will be our, our digital solutions, uh, the commercial lending platform, uh, our payments uh, platform that, that we're, we've spent so much time talking about, uh, and treasury and cash management. So uh, invitations will be going out in the next few weeks for that event. We hope many of you on this call and, and others can make it to the event this year. Now to wrap up the call, we are pleased with the results from our ongoing operations and the efforts of all of our associates to take care of our customers. Our executives, managers, and all of our associates continue to focus on what is best for our customers and our shareholders. I want to thank you again for joining us today. And, Sheree, will you please now provide the playback number? Uh, yes, the playback number will be 800-585-8367 with conference ID number 821-8009. Again, that's 800-585-8367, conference ID number 821-8009. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.